Hello, my name is Angel Wood, and this is Crime of the Truest Kind. you've had an amazing couple of weeks. I sure have. I thank all of you for checking out the show, downloading it. It's amazing. I always will say this. It feels great when there's more than zero listeners and you're everywhere. All over the United States. You're in Europe. Hello. I am due for a visit and um, post-COVID, I'm coming at you. So please continue to share and tag the show, Crime of the Truest Kind Everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, Truest Kind on the Twitters. And please, by all means, follow, subscribe, rate it on all the podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts. By doing so, you help me do a couple of things. You help spread the word about the podcast, more people learn about it, and that way I can dedicate more resources to the production of the podcast. So thank you. You know, this is always a very heavy subject matter, clearly, and it should affect you when you're reading about these stories and learning about things that you didn't know before. But at the same time, I have really enjoyed researching these stories and learning more about these stories. I have some new tricks on finding hard to find information. So that's been a great development over these last two weeks. On today's episode, I wanna tell you the story of Leanne Milius and Kimberly Farah, the double murder at Hedgehog Pond in Salem, New Hampshire. Salem, not the witch city in Massachusetts, Salem, New Hampshire. It is a bit less descriptive. The town seal says industry, commerce, recreation. It had a population of almost 29,000 at the time of the 2010 census. And it sits 31 miles to the north and considered an outer suburb of Boston, a commuter town, really. Salem is the first town in New Hampshire when you cross over on Interstate 93. And it will bring you through the state, into Vermont, and on your way to Canada. Salem has the world-famous Rockingham Mall, a traditional mall with halls and food courts, and it remains the largest in the region. Salem used to have the Rockingham Park horse track, where the famous Seabiscuit once raced in the 1930s. Over its history, the raceway had been used not just for horses, but for car and motorcycle racing. The track closed up in 2016 after its popularity had long diminished. I guess spending all your time yelling at prized horses for money had fallen out of favor. But racehorses, majestic beasts they are. And 110 years of racing and gambling was a very good run. The track was torn down in 2017. To make room for a new mixed-use development project, it is expected to offer approximately 2.8 million square feet in retail, shops, restaurants, hotels, entertainment, office space, and a variety of housing options. It actually sounds amazing. And it also sounds like the death knell to the traditional mall. There are a couple of landmarks and tourist attractions in Salem. One is called America Stonehenge. It is an archaeological site with a big bunch of rocks and stone structures, as its name would suggest. It sits on 30 acres of land with trails And an alpaca farm is there now. I must go. And most people I know from the area have never gone there. I have not. And um, I'm going to go take a drive up there when I'm done writing this episode. (laughs) It's not far from where I am. Salem was once home to the Granite State Potato Chip Factory, a staple of New Hampshire for 102 years before it closed in 2007. Located on North Broadway, they were pioneers in potato chip manufacturing in the U.S., And the property is now home to a Dunkin' Donuts. Of course it fucking is. There are Dunkin' Donuts next to Dunkin' Donuts in New England. This is not an ad for Dunkin' Donuts. The most notable landmark in all of Salem, New Hampshire, though? Canopy Lake Park. The famous amusement park that kids from near and far would visit every summer. Many of us still go. 
You can see performances like Mini Kiss, that's little people doing the songs of Kiss as it sounds. And I do recall a Janet Jackson impersonator there one year. I'm sorry, a Janet Jackson tribute. It remains a major employer for local kids. When I think of what it may have been like to work there, the movie The Way Way Back comes to mind. It was shot at the Waterways on the Cape, Pop and Lock. Look that one up, it's a good one. Sam Rockwell. I was surprised to learn that there are really no major celebrities from Salem, New Hampshire to speak of, except the Sununu political family. Former New Hampshire governor and White House chief of staff under George H.W. Bush, John H. Sununu and his eight kids. Two of his sons went into politics. John, a former U.S. senator, and Chris, who is now the current New Hampshire governor. I have no claim to fame other than my friend went to school with him and said he used to show up to school in a limousine. That's some real richy rich shit. There's a couple of New Hampshire memories coming back to me. There was a politician named Bill Zeliff, who we called Big Spliff. We were high when we thought of that. And Dick Sweat, because his name is Dick Sweat. There were big signs that read Dick Sweat all over the place in the 90s. Huge signs. In 1998, he was appointed U.S. ambassador to Denmark by President Bill Clinton. Neither one are from Salem. The murder of Leon Milius and Kim Farah happened in September of 1997. Details on this were surprisingly difficult to find in the beginning, but I soldiered on. It was a very big story in the area at the time. And of course, the dissemination of information was very different then. So was what we were able to learn about the victims of crime. Now, though, we know everyone's every move. In 1997, there was no social media, no smartphones. Many of us didn't know yet what electronic mail was. How did those words get through the wires? AOL dial-up was happening. We had AIM. What was your screen name? Do you remember? There was no live journal, no MySpace, no Blogspot, definitely no Facebook or Reddit, no Instagram, no Snapchat, and none of us were documenting our every move or our every bite. There was so much else about that time that is readily available about life in 1997 for a teenage girl. Kurt Cobain had been dead for three years. Godsmack were beginning their ascent into the post-grunge scourge. Soundgarden broke up. Alice and Chains were more than a year into their dormancy. But Pearl Jam, the stalwarts of alternative rock, managed to not self-destruct and were still making good music. Little Dave Grohl had put together his post-Nirvana monster called the Foo Fighters and released their second record in 1997, convincing everyone, including Dave Grohl, I think, that it was an actual band. Mariah Carey's Honey debuted at number one on Billboard the week of September 12th, 1997. I'll be honest with you, I had to Google that song because I couldn't place it for the life of me. Other artists on the top of the Billboard charts that week included Notorious B.I.G. and Puff Daddy, Backstreet Boys, Leanne Rimes, The Spice Girls, Third Eye Blinds, and Aqua with their song Barbie Girl. I am positive I thought that was hot rubbish in 1997. What else might a teenager be interested in in 1997? George Clooney was the new Batman. Netflix were getting on board the movie rental game. Buffy the Vampire Slayer premieres on the WB. Metallica released Reload. Ugh. And J.K. Rowling's first book in the Harry Potter series was published. Relevant to the interests of teenage girls in New Hampshire in 1997. Leanne Milius and Kim Farrow were friends. Leanne was 17 and a senior at Salem High School. Kim was about to turn 19. She would have been a senior that year at Salem High. Instead, she decided to drop out. The struggle to catch up with schoolwork just became too much for her. Kim had transferred to Salem to live with her father two years earlier from Winniconnet High School in Hampton, where her mother lives. If Winniconnet High School sounds familiar to you at all, it received much unwanted media exposure seven years earlier. It was ground zero for the Greg Smart murder case. His wife, Pamela Smart, worked as a media coordinator there and met the student who would murder her husband in their Derry, New Hampshire condo. It is one of New Hampshire's most sensational crime stories to date. I will not defend anyone that was involved in this case, but it was sensationalized beyond comprehension, and all involved were guilty in the court of public opinion before any of the trials even began. It was the O.J. Simpson case before Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman were murdered in 1994. I will cover that in a future episode with my very unique New Hampshire perspective, not O.J., the smart case. 
I'm certain the smart case has been covered to death over the last 30 years. All right, back to the story. The Suspects James Grant, 20, of Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Eric Jelanuski, 19, of Lunenburg, Massachusetts. Jelanuski had left for the military a year prior, but here he was, back in Lunenburg. We can all speculate on that. Christopher Doucette, 18 years old, of Manton, Michigan. And he was living with his grandparents in Lunenburg at the time of the murders. I don't know a lot about Lunenburg. It's a small town in the Metro West area. Its population is somewhere in the 10,000 range. I didn't think I knew anyone from there. I do have a lot of friends from neighboring Lemonster. But I did learn that Derek Kurzweil is from Lunenburg, according to his Wikipedia page. Because, of course, he has a Wikipedia page. Derek, pro-rock drummer, who was in Unearth. One of you will know that band. And hi, Ken Susie, but he's not from Lunenburg. But he is in Unearth. On September 13th, 1997, the bodies of Liam Milius and Kimberly Farah were discovered at Hedgehog Pond Park, a popular summer hangout spot for residents in and around Salem, New Hampshire. Leanne's body was found first by a woman walking her dog around 6.45 that Saturday morning. It's always somebody walking their dog. Do you think about that when you're out somewhere? I actually do. And I imagine we would all freak the fuck out. Leanne was found on the beach in full view of the busy Route 38, which leads you to the Rockingham Mall. This part of town is a high traffic area. Kim was found in a different spot in the park, suggesting that the two were separated when they were murdered. Now, it's not clear if anyone was looking for them at that time or if anyone was aware that they had been gone. Teenagers take off, stay at each other's houses, lie and tell their parents they're babysitting and drive to Boston to see Aerosmith. Wait, that was me. Their friends were last seen together at Leanne's house sometime around 1 a.m. the morning they were killed. Autopsies were conducted two days after the girls were found and showed Leanne's neck had been slashed. She had stab wounds to her torso. Her head had been smashed against something the court documents called a picnic pavilion, an open-air structure like a gazebo, I would guess. By most accounts, she was fully clothed and had bruises on her arms when found. No evidence of sexual assault was reported. Kim was found inside a wooden bathhouse inside the park. She was stabbed in the neck and the chest. The plan all along was to separate the two girls and kill them. That is what Eric Jelanuski planned and wanted to do. The girls died sometime after 1 a.m. when they were last reported seen and before 6.45 when that dog walking lady found Leanne. We will soon learn that Leanne and Kim died hours apart from one another. I really do hope that the girls had no idea what was going to happen to them. That would be true horror. I say girls when I talk about them because the term victims feels really impersonal to me. At the time of their deaths, they were still teenagers. Young women who had not realized what their lives would be or could be or how they might contribute. Shamika said I had potential. I can't imagine being a parent to one of these girls and having to live through this. After the girls were found, police combed the area on foot by rowboat and by helicopter, looking for anything that could tell them who did this to Leanne and Kim. The murder weapon was reported to be a five-inch stiletto knife that was found wrapped in a bloody shirt in an industrial park in Andover, Mass. James Grant, one of the suspects, testified that he stole a knife out of a drawer in Leanne's bedroom with the intention of using it in a robbery. Another report said the stiletto was Kim Farris, a gift from her boyfriend, and there's always some kind of discrepancy in reporting. It is believed to be the same knife. Authorities were able to find the knife's exact location after they were tipped off by suspect James Grant. He's a talker. Kim Farris Blue Chevy was located the morning of their murder, some 70 miles away in Oxford, Massachusetts and only about 40 minutes from Lunenburg, the area where the boys lived. Boys or men, they're all adults, but they still seem so young and dumb to me. Christopher Doucette's wallet and hat were found inside of Kim's blue Chevy that they tried to set on fire. Smooth move, dipshit. After they dumped Kim's car and tried to incinerate it and failed, the three suspects must have hit the road to make their way from Massachusetts to Michigan. It is at least a 14-hour drive with minimal stops. 
By the time Doucette and the dipshit showed up in Michigan, his mother said that the cops were already there looking to question them. He gave some bullshit story about how they'd been partying all night and the girls were fine when he left them at 4 a.m. There is always some truth hidden in the lies that people tell. This has to be right about the time they killed Leanne and left her bleeding on the beach and took off. They stopped at a gas station in Andover to clean up and dump their murder weapon. A mobile gas station along Route 93 was searched for evidence. The three suspects took off as soon as Doucette's mother told them they were now wanted for questioning in a double murder in New Hampshire. She called the police to tell them that they had shown up at her house. Good on her, though, for not being too keen on the prospect of fugitives sitting at her kitchen table. Once Kim's car was found and Christopher Doucette's identification was found inside, all bets were off. One local Michigan resident reported an open door at a trailer and had two officers check it out. Some food was found inside. Acting on another tip, the police went to the next residence, a farmhouse, where it is believed the three suspects broke in and may have been preparing to squat in order to evade capture. The police found them hiding out in an upstairs bedroom. The three fugitives were arrested at 10 o'clock, two hours after police were tipped off that they were in this area. All three suspects were wearing boots they'd found in one of the places they'd broken into. During their search, police came across three pairs of torch sneakers in the woods with several cans of lighter fluid nearby. One had Doucette's fingerprints on it. <laughs> He's really great at being awful at this. September 15th would be their last day of freedom. All of them were over 18. All of them would face adult charges. All three suspects asked for lawyers while in custody in Michigan. At the time this was reported in local news, the three were expected to be charged with receiving stolen property and breaking and entering in Michigan while awaiting extradition to New Hampshire for the murders. They spent a cozy night in county jail. Michigan State Police had found and seized Jelanowski's red Honda Prelude. Two Salem police detectives had already been to Michigan by that time to help investigate. The next day, the three murder suspects were flown to Logan Airport in Boston and returned to Salem, New Hampshire to face charges. In situations such as this, you wait for one of the suspects to crack. One uncomfortable night in a jail cell and someone's going to talk. Oh, and one did. It was James Gray who copped to the murders in the hours after they were arrested in Michigan. In the affidavit, he admitted to police that he and his two friends, Christopher Doucette and Eric Jelanowski, both of Lunenburg, Massachusetts, had killed Leanne Milius and Kimberly Farah. He told the police officer escorting him back to New Hampshire from Michigan that on September 12th, the day before the murders, that the three drove to Salem to see Leanne Milius. At some point, Grant and Jelanowski took a knife from Leanne's chest of drawers. Old school. Grant claimed he wanted the knife to rob a gas station later. James Grant made statements implicating all three of them in the murders. Investigators were able to determine that Jelanowski left a bloody fingerprint on Kim's body and that James Grant's watch had blood residue. All three men were charged with first-degree murder. Grant agreed to cooperate with the police and was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge. Jelanowski was charged with murdering Kim and would face a separate trial. Doucette was charged only with Leanne's murder. The prosecution's case against them was based largely on testimony from James Grant. Grant claimed that he, Jelanowski, and Doucette had left their homes in Massachusetts and traveled to Virginia in the weeks before the murders. On September 12th, they drove to Leanne's house in New Hampshire from Virginia and spent most of the day and evening with Leanne and her friend Kim. At some point during that night, Jelanowski told Grant that he wanted to kill both of the women and that Doucette agreed to help. In his testimony, Grant said Doucette and Jelanowski had started a fight to upset the girls. The fight was fake, designed to separate the two women. Everyone got back to Leanne's house and the girls went inside. It was during this time that Doucette and Jelanowski planned how they would separate Leanne and Kim and agreed that Doucette would walk off with Leanne while Jelanowski remained with Kim. Kim and Leanne were unaware of this plotting going on and returned to their car and all five of them drove to Hedgehog Pond Park. At the park, Doucette and Leanne went into the woods while Jelanowski and Kim went into a bathhouse. It's Grant's claim that he sat alone at a picnic table in the middle of the night 
while Jelanowski stabbed Kim to death in the bathhouse within minutes of their arrival at the park. He testified that after hearing Kim scream, he found Leanne and Doucette and asked him to check on Jelanowski while he stayed with Leanne. Doucette returned and pulled Grant aside and showed him the knife he was now holding. It's the knife that Jelanowski had just used to kill Kim. He gave it to Grant and said the two of them now had to kill Leanne. When Grant said he couldn't do it, Doucette took Grant to the bathhouse to see Kim laying there dead. Now, I don't know where Leanne is during this charade. The whole point was supposedly to keep Leanne from finding out about Kim being stabbed. There are things that don't add up to me. If Jelanowski is waiting with Leanne, it would be suspect because would he not have blood on him after just stabbing Kim to death in the bathhouse? I was able to learn from some deep digging into news banks in the Boston Globe and through court documents. It was reported that on that Friday night before the girls were killed, Leanne Milius walked into the Salem House of Pizza and told a friend who worked there that she was feeling afraid of a guy who liked her. He called himself Opie and was lurking around the house she shared with her mom. Leanne's mom, Mary Wallace, said a man identified as Opie had been repeatedly paging her daughter during the weeks leading up to the murders. James Grant, a blonde, who the affidavit says goes by the nickname Opie, was identified by a friend of Leanne's from Fitchburg named Jessica Phillips as the person she introduced to Leanne. Various news outlets had picked up on the report that in the days leading up to the murders, the three had been on a booze and a drug binge and watched the horror movie Scream a few times to mentally prepare for murder. While they reportedly also had Scarface, so were they mentally preparing to be Miami drug lords? Now, there's no way to know if they binged on booze and murder movies or if that had any effect whatsoever on the plans that they had already had for that night. It is theorizing on the part of the media, and we know a few things about that. They love to blow the shit out of the water. It sells papers, and it gets lots of page views. There's also the unrequited love angle. Since Doucette and Grant are both charged with killing Leanne, each his attorney was trying to pin it on the other. With Doucette's defense attempting to prove that Grant was angry with Leanne for not returning his affections and rejecting his advances, thus making the real motive for her murder to be jealousy rather than to conceal Kim's murder. It was known during testimony that Grant had met Leanne that summer and he was attracted to her and he told her as much. She did not return his affections, however. He acknowledged he and Leanne fought about three weeks prior to the murders. Evidence was excluded at trial that Grant had pushed Leanne to the ground and she had cut herself during the argument between them. He also admitted to calling her a bitch in a page he had sent to her. Oh, the pager, a.k.a. a beeper. It is the old-fashioned device that beeped you with someone's phone number and stops whatever you were doing and you immediately go and call that person. Grant did admit he was jealous, and he thought that Leanne liked his friend instead. He also admitted in his testimony that he had thought the two may have had sex when they disappeared into the woods together, only a few hours before her murder. It is important for me to interject here for the sake of both Leanne and Kim's memory. There's no evidence of any sexual activity taking place at Hedgehog Pond that night whatsoever. No reports of that at all. Grant did downplay any idea that jealousy came into play and said he was not upset with Leanne when they both stabbed her to death. You don't do that out of love, bro. What we do know is that these three men planned to murder Leanne and Kim that night. They took the knife and planned the setup, the fake fight, the ruse. We know Christopher Doucette and James Grant overpowered Leanne Milius and brutally and repeatedly stabbed her in the neck and stomach, leaving her lifeless body on the beach near a very busy roadway. We also know that Eric Jelanowski chased down Kimberly Farah as she tried to run and stabbed her in the neck and chest. What I don't know is how this was kept quiet and Leanne didn't know what was happening. Or maybe she did, and she was terrified. That is a grim realization. We know they left the badly bruised and bloodied bodies in the park. They did nothing to actually conceal their crimes. They made no effort to hide their bodies from anyone who might show up in the park that morning. It is a park with a pond for public swimming, a playground. They thought nothing of who might find them and what trauma they might cause. 
I guess it just goes along with stabbing two young women to death and not batting an eye. I don't know a lot about who Leanne and Kim were, except they were friendly girls who wanted pretty much what we all wanted at their age, to hang out, have a good time, experience new things, and meet new people. A little about Kim that I did learn is that she lived in Hampton, New Hampshire, and was a cheerleader at Winneconnet High School before she moved to Salem in 1995. She was friendly and would give a wave or a hello if you saw her rollerblading in the neighborhood. And though she dropped out of Salem High, she was working on her GED and preparing for her future. She was two days shy of turning 19. Leanne was sweet, and she was known to leave messages for her friends when she hadn't seen them for a while. She would flash an easy smile to neighbors as she caught the bus to Salem High every morning. She held down a part-time job at one of the clothing stores at Rockingham Mall, and it was unimaginable to everyone who knew them that anyone would want to hurt them. Leanne and Kim were robbed of a future, one that remains unrealized, the things they could have done. William Farah, Kim's dad, was interviewed on New Hampshire's WMUR Channel 9 on the 20th anniversary of their murders. September 13th, 2017, friends and family came to the park to honor their girls. He said five families lost their kids that day, but only two will never get a chance to see or speak to theirs again. That's true. Eric Chelanuski was convicted of first-degree murder and the death of Kimberly Farah. The judge in the case referred to the killers as a grisly gang and gave him the maximum sentence of life in prison without parole. He attempted to plead out, but the judge would have none of it. Today, he is 42 years old, is inmate 72213, and resides at the New Hampshire State Prison in Concord, New Hampshire. He has served 22 years of a life sentence. He maxes out on September 30th, 2097. In 77 years, he will be 119 years old. Christopher Doucette is inmate number 72808. He too is a resident at the State of New Hampshire Prison Resort. At 41 years old, he is serving a 37 years to life sentence for murdering Leanne Milius. The earliest he can get out is August 2035. That would make him 56 years old. He maxes out in 2096. James Grant, who is the talker, there's always a talker, reached a plea agreement for his testimony and got 25 years to life in prison. He admitted to helping Doucette murder Leanne Milius. New Hampshire State Prisoner 72813, he is now 42 years old. He could be released as early as September 2022. He maxes out in August 2096. What makes people behave this way? I don't know. But I'm willing to bet that had they gotten away with it, at least one of them would have killed again. That's often why killers act alone, because there is always a talker. Thank you for listening. Crime of the truest kind, covering mostly New England crime stories. I do have a few Northeast stories on my list. You can reach out at crimeofthetruestkind at gmail.com. Praise, please. I accept praise. I will be back in two weeks with another crime story right before Christmas. My gift to you. Crime of the truest kind everywhere, all major podcast platforms. Please listen and follow and subscribe and rate. Help me give the show a bump. Online crimeofthetruestkind.com. You can find all the show notes there. Keep your eyes peeled when you're out walking your dog. You, too, could find a dead body. My name is Angel Wood. This is Crime of the Truest Kind. Lock your damn doors. Oh.